author Evan Say It. We don't do many children's books on book TV, but we are going to feature yours, Apocalypse Now. Why do you think we're going to talk about your book? Well, because it's a faux children's book. It's certainly perfect for children. It's written for children, but it's also, forgive me, but it's also high political satire. And what I've really appreciated, including you having me on the show where you don't typically have children's books, is that you recognize that it is political satire for grown-ups. And when it first came out, it was number one in new release on Amazon three weeks in a row in both children's environmental books and adult political satire, political humor. So people are getting it. It's all about environmental issues. Environmental hysteria. Basically, it begins with a, a father reading to his terrified child who's terrified about global warming. And just one by one, I go through, and it's not even political, just one by one, I go through all of the various apocalypses, apocalypse being my made up plural for apocalypses. And, and the irony is, you can't have more than one apocalypse. Had they been right even once, going all the way back to, to when, when I was a child, back in the 70s, when they first threatened global cooling, global freezing. And after that, it was a hole in the ozone that was going to get us. And after that, it was acid rain that was going to get us. And just one by one, I list all the various apocalypse that, that we've been threatened with, and somehow we're still here. When did you get interested in these issues? Oh, the, the issue really is the education of our children. And look, to frighten children, who was it who said it? it was Rahm Emanuel, who said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Well, what's a better crisis than the one that's going to end the world? So I just want our children not to be afraid of global warming. Be concerned. Do the things that we can do. I'm not even, I'm not even a denier, necessarily. I'm just saying, let's avoid the hysteria that allows people to take advantage of us because we're so afraid. We go, here's our money, here's our power, here's our freedom. So it, it really is less of a, a, a denier's a book than it is, hey, we've been here before, we've dealt with acid rain, we've dealt with killer bees, we've dealt with mad cow, we've dealt with these things. Go to sleep, my child, you'll be okay. I'm Bruce Karasik, co-founder of the Jewish Republican Alliance, Thank you for joining us for another special edition of JRA Loudspeaker. We are thrilled to welcome back Evan Sayet to our show. We'll be speaking with Evan in just a few minutes. But first, my friends, the very soul of our academic institutions is now being tested. And the Jewish Republican Alliance is outraged and deeply troubled at the total failure of leadership by the university presidents from Harvard MIT and the University of Pennsylvania. Their lackluster response to the growing anti-Semitism on their campuses is not just disappointing, it's downright dangerous. In front of the entire nation, these presidents danced around the most straightforward of questions. Is calling for the genocide of Jews against university policy? Their responses were a slap in the face to every Jewish student, faculty member, and anyone with a shred of moral fiber. Let's be clear, when asked about condemning calls for Jewish genocide, there's only one correct answer. It's not a trick question. The Jewish Republican Alliance stands firmly against the wave of anti-Semitism that is seeping into our schools. When university presidents fail at the basic task of safeguarding the fundamental rights and safety of Jewish, Jewish students, they fail us all. It is a failure that resonates painfully in the hearts of every Jewish parent and every Jewish student. The fear and uncertainty that Jewish students face daily, they're not just the statistics, they are a reality a reality where walking into a campus environment can feel like stepping into enemy territory. Now, Elise Stefanik's heartfelt condemnation of these university presidents is more than justified. It is a reflection of the outrage felt by the entire Jewish community and all who stand against anti-Semitism. Her reaction was not political posturing. It was a wake-up call. When university presidents hesitate to speak out against such blatant anti-Semitism, it sends a message of approval. But our message is clear to the leaders of the economic institutions, to every teacher, every administrator, and every student. 
The Jewish Republican Alliance says enough. No longer can we stand by as our children are forced to navigate a landscape where their identity makes them a target. No longer can we tolerate a culture of fear and intimidation that silences voices and crushes spirits. We demand action. We demand change. And most importantly, we demand leadership that stands in the face of anti-Semitism. Our message to university leaders is simple. Step up or step aside. If you can't or won't do your job protecting all students, then you have no business running these institutions. It is time for universities to implement real, effective policies against anti-Semitism, to educate students and staff about what it looks like and why it is unacceptable. We also call on donors and alumni to take a stand. Your financial support to these universities must be contingent upon their adherence to zero tolerance for anti-Semitism. Continued financial backing in the face of such leadership failures is an endorsement of that culture. The Jewish Republican Alliance demands change and we demand it now. And to the students out there feeling isolated and afraid, know this, you are not alone. The Jewish Republican Alliance is with you. We are fighting for a future where your faith is a source of pride, not a target of hatred. Anti-Semitism has no place in our universities, no place in our society, and no place in our world. It is time for those in power in these institutions to step up and show real leadership. Anything else is totally unacceptable. I want to thank you all for being here. And now it is my pleasure to introduce live from Franklin, Tennessee, my good friend and fellow JRA co-founder, Mitch Silberman. Mitch, take it away. Thank you so much, Bruce. Very powerful words indeed, as always. You know, I saw a meme recently on social media that said, if your religion requires you to hate people, it's time to find a new religion. And given I only follow conservatives on social media, I know that was targeted towards Islamists. And I have a question for you. Were any of you surprised by the level of hatred that we saw on October 7th towards Jews? Sadly, I was not. They are indoctrinated from generation to generation to hate Jews. Now, we were horrified and shocked by their subhuman behavior, no doubt. But that kind of hatred, I mean, no Palestinian child has ever said on its own to, hey, mom and dad, you know what? I really just hate Jews. They are taught it. They are indoctrinated. In fact, look at their version of Sesame Street and how vile that is. So what was kind of surprising, though, was the other end of the religious spectrum. So these jihadists, these Islamists, are very religious, albeit misguided. But the other end of the spectrum are people who are godless. And there they were, siding with the murderers. I mean, did you ever think you would see an occasion where psychos would film themselves murdering people, raping women, beheading babies, and godless people, of course, on the left, are siding with them? That was a bit surprising. And I feel strongly we are all born with a God-shaped hole in us. If you don't fill it with God, you're going to fill it with something else. I observed that years ago in my relatives, where they replaced Judaism with liberalism. Now it's probably leftism. So there are beautiful individual atheists. There are horrible religious people. But here's, here's a situation where, as a group, you have the deeply religious, misguided, the atheists on this hand. And you know what they said? It's, it's another dreaded uh, example of intersectionality. You know what? You hate the Jews. We hate the Jews. High five. I mean, it, it's just awful. And so you see that the dangers of atheism as a movement, as a culture, you know, we've had some great speakers over the years. And I'm going to paraphrase Barack Lurie, who gave this example, that if you remove the sun from the solar system, what would inevitably happen to the planets? Well, they would, they would wobble and die. It's the same thing with God. You remove God from our culture, and we are witnessing real life wobbling and dying. It's dangerous. 
And I saw this in college before I was even, I mean, if you would ask me in college, are you politically involved? Nope. What are you? Like probably a Democrat, you know, 11th commandment, thou shalt be a Democrat, right? But I remember vividly in college when you'd get to know people and what's your name, what's your major, where are you from? And if religion came up, I heard this once, twice, three times. And after a while, it stuck with me all these decades later. If I said, what is your religion? And they would say, I'm nothing. Now think about that. They didn't say, I'm not religious. I'm not that observant. It's a mixed household. They literally said those two words, I'm nothing. And that stuck with me all these years. That's a dangerous way to think. So to talk in more depth about the folly and the dangers of atheism, we have a true expert with us today. And before I introduce Evan, I mean, the, may, some of you may have seen what happened earlier this week. You may either saw the video or maybe you read about it, but you can categorize this under two headings, either um, can't make this stuff up or you want proof God exists. Here it is. <laughs> Turkish lawmaker declares on the floor, Israel cannot escape the wrath of Allah, instantly collapses from a heart attack. Falls to the ground, hits his head. Sadly, I think he's still with us, but I mean, you just can't make that up. It's unbelievable. So I'm going to now have the distinct pleasure of introducing Evan. I met Evan probably two decades ago, and nice guy, professional comedian. And before our very eyes, he has transformed himself, thankfully not transitioned to Eva, but Evan has transformed himself into an intellectual, an author. In fact, I can't listen to Bruce Springsteen's book anymore, a song, uh, <laughs> born in the USA without thinking the way that Evan deconstructed that song in one of his books. It's really amazing. You have to read his books. So after a long career as a stand-up comedian, Late Night with David Letterman, and then TV, Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher, he was a writer. Evan gave a serious political lecture to the Heritage Foundation, and that is how, and now, how the modern liberal, now the woke, think. Well, the talk rocked the conservative world and remains, going on 20 years later, the single most viewed lecture in Heritage Foundation's history. Since then, Evan has published two best-selling books, The Kindergarten of Eden, The Woke Supremacy, and advised one presidential campaign, Ted Cruz, written four speeches for the first candidate and then President Trump. His newest book, Mag I love this title, Magic Soup, Typing Monkeys, and Horny Aliens from Outer Space, the patently absurd, wholly unsubstantiated, and extravagantly failed atheist origin myth, which is now available on Amazon. Evan, welcome to our show. Hey, Mitch, how are you? Good to see you again. Hey, Bruce. Welcome, Evan. So glad to have you back. It was so great to speak to you on the phone the other day. So excited to have you on and talk about your book. So tell the audience a little bit, what was your main inspiration for writing Magic Soup? You know, how does it contribute to the dialogue between science and religion? Talk a little bit about that, please. You know, one, one thing that I've noticed about people on the left, period, so it doesn't really matter what the issue is, but it became more and more in focus for, for me that the political left can never argue in the affirmative for what it is they believe. They can tell you why the, the, the police are, are unjust, but then they can't give you an alternative except defund the police, which is not an alternative. They can't give you an alternative. All they can do is say, you know, border policy is 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 racist, but they can't offer any grown up mature alternative to to and to, and they can't argue for anything they believe, including the alternative to God's existence. So I, I began to notice. And it really began all the way back when I was writing Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher, and, and he was a rather uh, uh, loud atheist, not quite a militant atheist, but he would have people like Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens, uh, people who really were militantly atheistic. And it's so important that, that people understand atheism as a personal belief has probably been around, you know, for forever. But militant atheism the aggressive enforcement of non-belief across a society is really rather new to modern to modern times it only began to get credence intellectual credence when karl marx published the communist manifesto and it was another 50 years until we had our first militantly atheist regime in leninism in lenin's in lenin's russia and if you go from that 100 years, that's 100 years ago, the Russian Revolution, through today, there have been five militant atheistic ideologies. 
Leninism, Stalinism, Hitlerism, Maoism, and now wokeism. And so I decided that well, how the left wins the God argument is only through ridicule of our side. But they never offer what the alternative is. You know, they people dismiss God as non-scientific. Well, science requires an alternative hypothesis be put forth. And this book examines the alternative hypotheses, which are the, the universe came out of nowhere and nothing. The, the, the cosmos organized themselves in utter contradiction to the second law of thermodynamics went from literal chaos. I mean, the instant after the Big Bang is, is literally the definition of chaos to utter precision. And, and so what are the atheist scientific alternatives? And they turn out to be magic soup, the primordial ooze, typing monkeys, which is basically the uh, infinite monkey theorem, they don't say that it actually happened. They just say it's not impossible for these things to have happened because with enough time, this could have happened. How did life come from the uh, insentient? Uh, monkeys typed it. I mean, they really have nothing but the ridiculous. And I decided it was time that we ridiculed them. <laughs> well, you're perfectly suited for that. You're both a comedian and now an intellectual. So that's great. So, you know, there's so many terrible things going on in the world. You know, obviously, October 7th is near and dear to all of our hearts. And um, you name it, there's a long list of things going wrong. But yet somehow you felt this is the time to release a book on atheism against in, in, it, actually. In, so to, well, to, 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 to talk about it, to reintroduce, you know, I even though I think I do a good job of arguing on behalf of not only God's existence, but a monotheistic God. Uh, my, my point isn't necessarily to convince the reader. And this book is intended for believers to give to their non-believing children to say, if you read one thing, because there are other books out there that attempt to do somewhat the same thing I do. I mean, there's a great book. It became a series of books uh, called the, the Case for a Creator. Uh, and it's just argued in a very uh, litigious way and in, in, in a very, very legalese, as, as one would imagine, the case for a creator. Whereas this one's a little more fun, a little more uh, readable that you might get a 20 something, a 30 something. If you said to them, I love you and do me a favor, read this one book. I wanted this to be the one book that put God back in play not necessarily convinces them, but there are so many kids, and by kids, I mean anybody from 12 to almost 50 these days, who went through this, this indoctrination process. And as, as David Gelertner has said, the Yale uh, computer science professor said, they don't even rise to the level of atheist. They've never given God's existence any thought. And the reason they don't is because it's extra scientific. God is, by definition, extra scientific. But so Two is every one of the alternatives, because there are only two possibilities, given that the universe exists. There are only two possibilities. One, it always existed, which is outside of the dimensions of time. OK, so that has to be rejected by, by the leftist definition, by the materialist definition. If it's outside of our dimensions, it's extra scientific. Or it wasn't always here and it came from somewhere else. Well, that's outside of, of the materials and the forces and the laws of our universe. Therefore, that's extra scientific. No matter what, the, the, the fact that the universe is here is extra scientific. Now, there are two possibilities. Which one is more likely? Not which one is true because you can't prove it. You can't prove it using our laws and, and, and materials because by definition, it's outside so which one is more likely? And by the time I'm done with this book, if you don't say it's 99.999% likely there's a God, uh, then then I, A, I failed, but B, I think I do it. Well, so well said. You know, I we talked a little bit about the other day. You know, when you think about how fine-tuned the universe is and the the number of things that have to go precisely right for life to form. The, the fact that 
human beings are so complex that every organ is so complex. I know, but, but, but can, I, can I just interrupt for a minute? You're sure. already so far down the line talking about the, the complexity of the human body that putting aside that every single one of their theories is scientifically impossible. For example, again, the second law of thermodynamics says things don't go from chaos to precision. They go from precision to chaos, right? Putting aside that every single one of the, 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 the theories that they've put forth are scientifically, is scientifically impossible, they then become statistically impossible. And you don't have to go all the way to, to, to the complexity of the human body. Just start with the complexity of what allowed life to first begin. The universe could not exist. Here, here's the number, the odds of, forget how the universe first came into being, which they can't explain, but somehow it did come into being, how it went from chaos to precision, if one part in 80 million trillion 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 was even the slightest bit different, the universe wouldn't continue to exist. If the gravitational force were a, a 10,000 trillion trillion trillion, I believe it is, uh, stronger, then the universe would have collapsed upon itself. The, the gra gravitational pull would have collapsed the Big Bang. If it was 10, one, whatever the number is, it's huge. Uh, it, it, if it was weaker, the universe would have continued to expand and ripped apart. So every single part of their theory, of their, uh, of their origin myth, along the way is at once scientifically impossible and then if it wasn't scientifically impossible, it would be statistically impossible. And then if it wasn't statistically impossible, it would just be patently absurd, wholly unsubstantiated, and extravagantly failed in its every single test. Yeah, what I was going to ask you, I, I totally agree. Uh, I, I was going to ask you, I always like to mock the concept of evolution. The whole idea that we just evolved from nothing Um then how come there's no fossil record of people that have four arms on one side and there's no fossil record of like 12 heads or somebody's butt being in the front? There's none of this. None of this yeah, out the, there. It all the, the is world, the same. The world's leading paleontologist, Stephen Jay Gould, said that neo-Darwinism is dead. Not that it's on life support, not that it's wounded, not that... Neo-Darwinism is dead. If you look at the fossil record, it is just absolutely dead. And, and you know, Darwin is the one big thing that they have. They you, you will notice that they never make an argument for how the universe came into existence or how the DNA code was written or how life came from the insentient. All they will ever talk about is Darwin. Well, first, before we even talk about Darwin, before we talk about what Darwin is, let's talk about what Darwin isn't. Darwin doesn't attempt to explain the advent of the universe. The atheist best explanation for the advent of the universe is still stuff happens, luck. All right. It, it's not an attempt to explain the, the, the precision of the cosmos. It's, it's a small local theory at the very, very, very end of the atheist origin myth that doesn't attempt to answer any of the big questions. And as a one-time, one-off, ad hoc theory. It doesn't explain anything else in the universe except this one tiny question. And even that is still monkeys with typewriters. How how did you, you, you know the expression, if you put enough monkeys in the room with enough typewriters, eventually they will type the, the, the collective works of William Shakespeare. In other words, anything's possible. Well, first of all, anything's possible is not a scientific theory. In fact, it's the opposite of a scientific theory. If anything's possible, then there are no laws and constants of the universe, of, of science. And so basically, every time the atheist uses the infinite monkey theorem, he is acknowledging that he must deny the existence of science. Right? He has no theory. So you have now... This, this little theory at the very, very, very end of, of the atheist origin myth, and there's a big lie involved with Darwinism. They have fooled people into believing that Darwin came up with the theory of evolution. He didn't. He came up with a theory about evolution. 
he no more came up with the idea that things evolve. Of course, thing, of course, the universe evolved from the Big Bang to the precision of the cosmos to life on Earth. To and and even in the Bible, the Bible's theory has a progression and evolution of 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 of, hu of of animal existence. Right? He simply came up with a theory, and this is his theory: random mutations acted upon by 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 natural selection over time now notice that the first two random and natural aren't even theories if, if i said to you uh hey i know how penn and teller did that trick the the rabbit was just randomly there and then it just naturally sawed itself in half you would know that i don't know how he did the trick well random mutations acted upon by natural selection doesn't say anything. It's still just the infinite monkey theorem, random and natural over time. And so even Darwin's theory is not actually a theory. Hmm. Fascinating when you break it down. You know, I actually think your book is very timely, Evan, because there's so much chaos in the world. That's not an accident. That's not an accident. Mitch. Right. I, I, I know you're going to ask a question, but I don't like writing books. I only write books when I think there's something that's being missed out there. That's why I want the, the, the woke supremacy. You know, it was just at that moment when I would, I, they, they were rioting in the streets and they, and, and they would interview them and they didn't know what woke was. And I did. <laughs> so I, I felt the need. So this book is timely because I timed it to be so. Correct. On purpose. So I, I have my own ideas about this, but how do we get to the point where, for thousands of years, people prayed. Uh, they they not everyone obviously, but they prayed. They worshipped God. They feared God. And now we've gotten to the point where, if you ask a typical teenager, you know, like God, oh religion, oh I mean, it's like mocked now. Like religious has become mocked. It's How do we get it's, to this point? Yeah, it's it's even worse than that. It's not just mocked, but we're blamed for every every war, every prejudice, every ill that has ever been, that if they can only eliminate it, you know, and, and again, this goes back to militant atheism and the reason that, they, look, there's no reason to try to enforce your belief about God on somebody else, certainly not as a government or as an ideology or as a movement. And, and the deal that every militant atheist movement, again, Leninism, Stalinism, Hitlerism, Maoism, and now wokeism, and by the way, if you think it's just me, a right wing, trying to make this comparison, it was actually Bill Maher who compared wokeism to Leninism, Stalinism, and Maoism. And I suspect the only reason he left out Hitlerism is because it's gauche. You, you know, the, the horrors, the specific horrors of the Holocaust are such that you just don't make that comparison. Because in some ways, wokeism is closer to Nazism than it is to the others. Because Nazism and woke, let me do it this way, wokeism is the most race-based ideology since Hitlerism. Right? Communism isn't race-based, it's class-based, and it's a class supremacist movement. And Islamicism is a creed supremacist movement, and Nazism was a race supremacist movement. Mm -hmm. And every militant atheist movement that there's been, okay, the five that I've mentioned, all make the same promise. They all promise that if you reject God, God, people who believe in God have made this horrible world. There's been war, there's been bigotry, there's been all these horrible things. If you will reject God and allow us, consider us to be gods, we will create, we will engineer an entirely new kind of human being who will then bring the perfect world. And so communism promised to engineer, if, if you said the government was God, the state was, was God, they would engineer a human being who is wholly without self-interest, who is not selfish. He, he would toil to the best of his abilities and ask for himself only the, 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 what his minimum needs were, and that would bring about a worker's paradise. Right? The Nazis promised if you if you made us gods, we would create the perfect human being who was wholly devoid of human emotion. He would be he would make the right calculation because he wouldn't be distracted by by such trivial things as as empathy and compassion. Well, the promise of the woke make is that if you will call them gods, if you will give them the power of God, 
They will create the human being who is wholly devoid of hatred. They are going to, and by the way, they've done an outstanding job of it. If you look at the successive generations, they are more and more and more devoid of hate. The problem is that love and hate is a single concept. You can't separate them. You can't love good unless you hate evil. You can't love justice unless you hate injustice. You can't love beauty unless you hate ugliness. And so by eliminating hate, they've eliminated people who care at all. They are utterly indifferent. The reason they side with the Palestinians is because they don't hate terror. They don't hate rape. The reason they're not upset by, by what happened is because they don't hate evil. And, and if you look at, they, they don't love beauty. They don't have, they, and the militant atheists, by the way, throughout the different eras, they had different names. The gods were called the state or the party in communism, right? They were called the Führer in Nazi Germany, uh, or well called it Big Brother. And today they call the gods the science. And the science has convinced them that, that there is nothing to love and there is nothing to hate. And if you love or hate, then you are a bigot. Well, I have a challenge for you. What yes, do sir. you say to the people who believe that there is a God, but then question whether God is really present and knows them more than just maybe our, many of our founding fathers were deists. They believed that there was a God that created the world and universe, but he wasn't involved in their personal lives. So, for example, people on October 7th could lose faith. People, 200,000 people who were killed in an earthquake or childhood cancer or people can get these challenges and say, well, I believe that there's a God who created the universe, but they question whether there is a God that's involved in their lives. How do you answer that question? Well, I, I don't think it's it's necessarily necessary for, for people to believe that God is active in their lives. It's that they are active and that there is something bigger and better. And 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 without God, there there is nothing bigger or better. And that's the problem that these kids are having. And, and I wrote this for, for, and I say kids, again, anybody from 12 to, to 40 or 50, because they are so desperate. I go through uh, the statistics of, of what those raised in the militant atheist era. That's basically today. You know, if you go back to my earliest works, because this is sort of a uh, um, an unintended third book in an unintended trilogy. Uh because it's, it's all been the same argument that, that they've eliminated rational thought because thinking is an act of bigotry. And if you believe in anything, you might fight for that thing. And therefore the way to have peace on earth is to believe in nothing. Well, if you believe in nothing, every one of those devastating things you just talked about becomes even worse because you have nothing to hold on to. You have nothing to look forward to. And I went through the statistics and the kids, and this is from the CDC, this is from the Biden administration surgeon general, just to show it's not, it's not political, uh, but they are, they are committing suicide at un, unprecedented rates. They are committing homicide at unprecedented rates. There is an epidemic of depression, of self-hurting, of, of anxiety, of all of these things because the militants have taken away from them, not just God, but when you take away God, it, it, this is not me saying this. This is what I'm what I've observed. When you take away God, you take away beauty, you take away love. The, there's a loneliness epidemic today. And of course, there's always been loneliness, but it's always been a, a an ailment of the elderly. You know, people who have lost people close to them and, and whose physical realities make it hard to get out and socialize. Now it is gen. Z, I believe it is, might be Gen X, that is the most depressed in all of American history. Certainly, there's nothing in reality that should lead to that. But it's the fact that they they don't have friends, they don't have art, they don't have beauty. And it just seems to me self-evident that this all stems from not having God. You know, Evan, there's that uh, famous... Uh, saying that the, the lie makes its halfway halfway around the world while the truth is still putting its pants on, right? Right. I remember when I was in college, we're talking, you know, four decades ago. Even then, I remember here being taught somewhere from a professor 
that um, religion has killed more people than any other movement in the history of the world. Now, we can refute that with statistics, but statistics don't really move people. We can talk about all the death toll in the 20th century, you know, but how would you address, again, with, with an eye on your book, how would you address someone who says this well-known fact to you? Yeah, well, this this was certainly in my book, in my book, in my book until, you know, you have to make choices and decisions. And this had, had been a part of the book up until the, to, to the very, very end. The reality is, if we are as, 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 I think it's Richard Trivers who wrote the opening. Uh, he, he's 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 an evolutionary biologist from Harvard, and he wrote the opening to the book that made Richard Dawkins famous, the the selfish gene. And he said there is no objective qualitative difference between the species. And it's funny because he said, as an evolutionary biologist, it simply cannot be so. Not that there's any. Of course, we are objectively qualitatively superior to the other beings because the objective quality we possess is the ability to think and, and to conduct science, to, to, to gather the evidence and to carefully examine it to come to a reasonable conclusion. So if it is true that we are in no way morally, intellectually, in any other way above the other species, then we should be living in the jungle. We should be living where, where survival of the fittest is the law that we live by. If that's all there is, or even worse, as Richard Dawkins says, there's nothing but pitiless indifference. If that were true, then everything would be warfare constantly, just as it is amongst the other beings that we're supposedly not superior to. So it's actually the opposite. Why would there be any peace at all? Why would there be any civilization at all? And the answer is only because of religion. And in fact, if you look at what religion has done, especially the, the, the Judeo-Christian monotheistic the biblical version of, of, of the religion, it has provided, it has not only prevented war because killing for no reason, we're the ones who came up with the concept of a just and an unjust war. That didn't exist and that doesn't exist without religion. We also offer peaceful ways to, to achieve what you desire. For example, uh, uh, colonization, colonialism was ended peacefully, relatively peacefully without war, because you could appeal to the Judeo-Christian values. The civil rights movement was entirely a Judeo-Christian movement. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he was not saying let's destroy Christianity. He was he was imploring people to better live up to their Christian values. So if you think about the, the, the human rights so when, when, when you capture prisoners, all right? The uh, Geneva Convention is only because of, of Judeo-Christianity. So the reality is it's religion that has led to peace and, and, and humane treatment because without it, if we are not better than the animals, then the only thing we could be is an animal. Well, I, I so agree with you. The whole idea you know, where the Biden administration accuses Israel of indiscriminate bombing when they have always said how careful they are not to do that, ignores exactly what you just said, that the whole concept of preservation of human life and the importance of that came from the Torah and Jewish teachings and then further in Christianity. So those Judeo-Christian -Christi values are what Israel was founded upon. And so to accuse them of doing something that's against the fiber of every part of their being is just political backstabbing. Oh, it's, 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 it's horrible. But if you go back to my very first book, The Kindergarten of Eden, How the Modern Liberal Thinks, you know, I lay out the, the four laws and the three corollaries of what has become. Unfortunately, if I went back to 15 years or 20 years when I first gave the speech that the book is based on, there's not a word I would have to change. And I laid out the first two laws. Uh, I, I laid out four, but let me give you two. I'm going to give it to you as it's written in the book as best I can remember it and then explain. But the first rule is that the, the woke, the modern liberal, was raised to believe that indiscriminateness is a moral imperative because its opposite is discrimination. Right In the 1980s, by no coincidence, when the first babies born after World War II 
the ones who became the children of the 60s, when they started to become the powers that be in the 80s in, in, in uh, academia and journalism and entertainment and politics, in the 1980s, thinking was outlawed. All right, it was deemed to be a hate crime. And the reason behind this is anything that you believe, Bruce, Mitch, everybody, anything you believe, anything I believe, anything anybody believes is going to be so tainted by our personal bigotries that the only way not to be a bigot is to never think at all. all right, the second law, and this is because if, if they just didn't think, you would think that they'd sometimes be right, they'd sometimes be wrong, they'd sometimes be somewhere in the middle. But the woke are not only always wrong, they're always as wrong as wrong can be because of the second law. And again, I'll give it to you as written in the book, and, and then I'll explain. But indiscriminateness of thought does not lead to indiscriminateness of policy. Indiscriminateness of thought leads invariably, inevitably, deciding with evil over good, wrong over right, ugly over beautiful, injustice over justice. Why? Because if nothing is better than anything else, then success is unjust. If nothing is worse than anything else, then failure, as proved by nothing other than the fact that it failed, is proof positive that somehow the failure has been victimized. And then just if, if we extrapolate, if success and failure is unjust and great success and great failure is a great injustice, and exceptional success and exceptional failure is the most exceptional injustice of all. And so they look at the exceptional success of the, of the Jewish people, the state of Israel, and they look at the exceptional failure of the Palestinians. And all they conclude is that there must be exceptional injustice being done by the Jews. They don't need to know what it is. They will make it up. You know, this is one thing that has always struck me, how, how often the political left will actually tell you that they're lying. My my book, my new one, the the uh, you 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 called it magic soup. I'm still trying to find a short name for it. Uh, I'm going to go with the atheist origin myth. But in the atheist origin myth, I begin it with a quote from a evolutionary biologist and a militant atheist named Richard Lewontin, Harvard University evolutionary biologist, and he said, "quote Actually, I can't quote. I have to paraphrase." But we take the side of science, despite its patent absurdities. This is where I get the title from. We take the side of science, despite its patently absurd constructs, wholly unsubstantiated, just so stories and extravagantly failed theories, because we have a prior commitment, a prior commitment to materialism. So he, he's out and out saying that we are, when we tell the kids that science has proved God doesn't exist, we're lying because we have a prior political commitment to materialism, which is the militant atheist euphemism for atheism. All right? The answer has to be in a materialistic form, i.e., or uh, not, not in the spiritual form. So I go back to my original book, my first book, The Kindergarten of Eden, and it starts with a quote from Howard Zinn. That is almost the, the exact thing. He said, objectivity is undesirable. If you think that history should serve a social purpose, if you think that it should in some way advance the causes of humanity, then you make your choices based on that. So you've got the leading historian and the leading scientists both admitting that they lie about, in the one case, history and the other science, that, that that's called propaganda. And every militantly atheist movement, Leninism, Stalinism, Hitlerism, Maoism, and now wokeism, has had a prior commitment to the political cause to which they, they then subserviated the truth. You're uh, you're reminding me when I read your books about how you broke down that you can't have judgment. It was it was really profound. Um, so I mentioned we did a broadcast a few weeks ago, Evan, and I mentioned that in my opinion, um, of course, I'm going to pivot to politics. That's how we met. Mm -hmm. And we are the Jewish Republican Alliance mm -hmm. that the way that you you can no longer say I support Israel and I vote Democrat to me, they become mutually exclusive. Indeed. You must have friends and or family in your life that really do value Israel, right? They don't just pay a lip service. 
but they go vote Democrat. What would you say to them about even now with what this administration is doing, where all the anti-Semitism is coming, even now you're still voting Democrat? Like, what would you say to this person? Well, fortunately, every one of my close people, uh, one by one, came over to my side. Even, even, even the one that I thought was the hardest case is actually now more. Uh, I don't. I don't know that you can say she's more to the right than I am because I'm. I'm not even sure how far right I am. What I. What I. I often say I'm not a right wing extremist. I am an anti left wing extremist. I, I think that if we were to defeat leftism, which now has such control of the Democrat Party, uh, there, there might be a number of issues in which we would be able to find middle ground like we always used to. You know, it's it's not it's not your grandfather's Democrat Party. And, and that would be more my point to, than anything else in trying to convince them is that, you know, enough about how evil my side is. Tell me, uh, tell me about your side. You know, and that's kind of what I did with this book. You know, enough about how stupid I am for believing in God. Tell me, what do you believe? And and that's exactly what I did with this book. Terrific. Evan, I want to get back to education. Just as the world didn't come into being by accident, the culture that we've created didn't come by accident. In, a, in an attempt to separate church and state losing the meaning what that was all about we have sadly given our students one point of view they have they will never hear about your book unless progress is made so they're only hearing one argument and mm -hmm. in order for us to actually change the world to to kun ulam to heal the world under the kingdom of god but it's our job mm -hmm. as people to finish that and you're doing a service with your book that I hope can get into the education system to at least getting people to start thinking of, hmm, maybe there's another side to all this. Here, here's the good news. The kids are so desperate. They know they're being lied to. They know that their lives are, are being made miserable. They know, but they don't know where else to turn. And, and for the longest time, I've said that's our responsibility is just to find one person, one person in your life. And if you are able to, <laughs> it's funny because the cave analogy, you know, goes all the way back. But this is what worked for me is that if, if you've been brought up in a cave and they've told you there's nothing on the outside, there's nothing on the outside, there's nothing on the outside. All it takes is one pinprick and just a little light to come in and you won't know what's out there, but you will know that you've been lied to. And the kids do know that they're being lied to. They know that a boy can't be a girl and a girl can't be a cat. All right. And and this is why uh, Prager and Prager U is doing so, so well. This is why Ben Shapiro and the Daily Wire is doing. This is why Jordan Peterson is doing so well. Uh, this is why Charlie Kirk is doing so well. And, and hopefully... This book will be just one more thing that that says to him and says says to them, you know, you don't have to know that there's a God. Just know that you don't know that there's not. You, so I I'm so intrigued by that thought. You really think that these young people, whether they're six years old or eighteen years old, you think that they know they're being lied to. I I I I know this for a fact. I mean, I know that they are listening to. Uh, look, look, there there are those who have been totally brainwashed. I mean, those are the ones on the streets. But you know what? If you look at their numbers, it, it, they're really not compared to to how many people are out there. They're really not impressive. What's impressive is by comparison, because we don't step up, because we don't counter it. Because, but I, I think those days are changing. I think Donald Trump was one of the the most significant acts of civil disobedience in human history. <laughs> yeah, I believe his election was, there's a, there's a hierarchy. There's a, a, a progression of things that you do in a civilized society when you believe that you have been uh, aggrieved, righteously aggrieved, all right? The first is maybe you, you, you go to your local newspaper, but what do you do when the media is corrupt? 
You know, so then you protest. We did protest the Tea Party, and they succeeded in turning us into bigots and racists. So the next thing you do is civil disobedience, which is what I think Donald Trump's election was. Well, if they are successful in preventing his reelection, as they were the first time, if they if they were to put him in jail, if they were, I I think that there's only one step after civil disobedience, and that's kind of frightening. But I do think you're going to start to see the numbers, and I do I, I we are seeing the numbers. It's just it's easier to to be on the political left because you don't risk anything, you know. But one of the things that I try to convince the reader in my book is how much they've lost because of militant atheism. They they don't. There's, there's a friend of mine. His name is Jeremy Adams. He wrote a book called Hollowed Out. Jeremy was the uh, teacher of the year in California a few years back. And he wrote about how the students these days have been hollowed out. They don't even seek love. They don't even seek knowledge. They don't even seek beauty. They don't even seek friendship, which is why their faces are buried in their cell phones. You know, people who think that that the young are not knowledgeable about the world because they're buried in their cell phones are, are, have, have cause and effect reversed. They bury their face in their cell phones because there's nothing the militants have left them in this world. There's, you know, when 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 John Lennon did nothing other than to put the militant atheist doctrine to song. That's all he did. That's that's the militant atheist doctrine. Imagine no countries. You know, it's a globalist ideology. Imagine no religions. It's a militant atheist ideology. Imagine no possessions. All right. When he put he said a world without God, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, a world without God would be a peaceful paradise because there'd be nothing to kill or die for. Mm. What he didn't tell his victims is that a world with nothing to kill or die for is, an, is a world with nothing to live for and no reason not to kill. And again, if you look at the epidemics, uh, CD, I'm not making, I'm not using the word frivolously. The CDC has declared these things to be epidemic, and they include suicide because there's nothing amongst the young, because there's nothing for them to live for, and an epidemic unparalleled in, 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 in our history of multiple random killing, because there's no reason not to kill. If we are nothing other than, than a random collection of insentient materials as pitilessly indifferent as, as, as a... Uh, as a star crashing into you know, a comet, smashing into a, then then why not? Why not go out and be piteously indifferent towards the other beings? It is militant atheism that is responsible for every single one of these epidemics. And the number of epidemics is epidemic. You know, Evan, we we deeply appreciate your friendship and your support of the Jewish Republican Alliance, uh, almost probably since its inception. Since day one, tell tell our listeners a little bit about your thoughts on the Jewish Republican Alliance and the important work that we're doing. Well, you know there there was a time when there was another alliance, another group that that I was close with, and they did good work. And then they went kind of top down, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But they they went to Washington and they became. And what was missing was the grassroots. It, it, there, there is something about fellowship. There's something about being in a room with, with people so you know you're not alone, so that you know. And I, I got to tell you, one of the things that, that I love about what you guys do, and it's the thing that really brought me over to become a, a, a Republican in the first place. When I was still on the other side of things, I called myself a 913 Republican because 9-11 didn't surprise me. All right. Like you weren't surprised by the response, Mitch, to to I think it was I think it was in your talk. Um, 9-11 didn't surprise me. Obviously, I didn't know the date. I didn't know the target. The, the amount of carnage sickened me. But even as a brain dead liberal, I knew just enough about the world to know that the same people who were murdering the Jews of Israel for no other reason than that they were the closest infidels who were murdering the Hindus in India for no other reason than that they were the closest infidels who had just recently murdered children in Beslan, Russia, for no other reason they were the closest infidels would, when they could figure out a way across those giant oceans, 
because they were so primitive because of their hatreds that they couldn't even, they had to hijack our technology in order to come finally kill us. But of course, if and when they found a way to, to come get the great Satan, the, 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 the big devil, well, of course they would. What stunned me and shocked me and, and began to open my eyes was the liberal response, the leftist response to the attacks, the idea that we deserve them, that they were the chickens coming home to roost, as uh, uh, the President Obama's spiritual advisor would say. Uh, and, and I realized I had to go out and find people who, even just on this one issue, had my back because I thought militant uh, 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 Islamism had arrived on our shores. And I went and I attended my very first Republican meeting. I Googled San Fernando Valley Republican Club, came up with Gary Amanoff's organization, San Francisco, uh, San Francisco, uh, San Fernando Valley Republicans Club. And when I walked into that room, I heard something I had never heard before. I heard people who could argue their beliefs in the affirmative. All right. Who could say, this is why I believe this. This is how it works. This is where it's worked in the past. This is what it's going to cost. And, and that's what I love about your organization is it's, it's, in a, it's an affirmative organization. And it has something truly good and special. Not just everybody who disagrees with us is a Nazi. Everybody who disagrees with us is a fascist. Everybody who disagrees with us is a homophobe. That's what I always heard as a Democrat. But you walk into the JRA gatherings. And, and you hear smart people making smart arguments, not always in agreement with each other, which I think is part of the greatness, but always with the, the, the kind of intellect and thought that you simply do not see from the political left. Very kind of you. Wow, we really appreciate <laughs> Thank it. Thank you, Evan. Thank you for being on. Where can our audience get your book? I, I think the best thing to do, and, and I, I can't imagine anybody doesn't know my name in, in this particular group, but perhaps, but my last name is Say It, S-A-Y-E-T. It's the easiest name in the world, Say It. There's almost nobody in the entire world with that same last name. So go to Amazon and type it in, go to Google and type it in. Just, just look for me, look for this book. I do believe, you know, again, I don't like writing books. I wrote this book for a reason. And, and uh, hopefully you guys will read it uh, and then give it to somebody you love, somebody who was a good, smart kid, and then they went to college. <laughs> you know, and, and 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 I think this book, because of the way I argue it, it's fun, it's funny, it's filled with ridicule and snark. Uh, but it's also, as you know, I kind of found to be my niche, uh, serious at the same time. So that is great. We we never want to let school interfere with our education. <laughs> Evan, thank you so much for being there with us today. You're welcome back anytime. Uh, thank you for writing uh, I'm, such I'm, an amazing I'm, I'm book. Free. I'm, I'm free next Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great okay, one. sorry. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much. Always great to see you. Be well. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here and for always supporting the Jewish Republican Alliance. Uh, to our, our Jewish members, we wish you a very happy last day of Hanukkah. Uh, to our Christian members and friends, we wish you a very Merry Christmas and to all uh, a Happy New Year. Uh, for those of us who, those of you out there that would like to support our organization, just go to JewishRepublicanAlliance.org, uh, click on the membership tab, make a donation, do whatever you can to help us support and support us with the great work that we're doing. Until we meet again, wishing you all the best and wishing you all very well. Thank you again for joining us. Bye-bye for now. Happy Hanukkah. Merry Christmas.